Our scripture reading this morning comes from Genesis chapter 37, verses 31 through 35. This is the moment when uh, Jacob's son, his 11 sons, come to him and lie to him, telling him that his favorite son, Joseph, has been killed in the wilderness. Then the sons took Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They had the long robe with sleeves taken to their father, and they said, We have found this. See now whether it is your son's robe or not. And Jacob recognized it and said, This is my son's robe. A wild animal has devoured him. Joseph is without a doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and daughters sought to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to my grave mourning for my son. Thus his father bewailed him. And God had his blessing to the reading of this word. Last week, I had the pleasure during the Sunday school hour of going into our children's Sunday school class and being able to talk with the children just for a few moments about the story of Jacob and Esau. A story about something that had happened when Jacob was a young man. And I have to say, our kids did a wonderful job answering every question I asked them about this amazing story. Well, our story today comes from later in Jacob's life. In fact, it could be the worst moment of his life. Moment when disaster fell upon him, and it did, as disasters so often do, came quickly to Jacob. And his judge sons came to him holding Joseph's robe, torn and bloody, and there it was. His son was gone. His beloved Joseph was dead. He was, as the scriptures say, inconsolable over this grief, this disaster that came his way. Not ever knowing what the truth of it. Right during this time, he never found out until much later that actually Joseph was alive, had been sold into slavery, and was at that moment heading to Egypt as a slave. The moment came suddenly, and it was a moment, a disaster that certainly was never expected. So many disasters are never expected in our lives. Think of all those right now in South Carolina who, uh, one week ago, had never heard of what was then Tropical Storm Florence. And then a week later, here it is, disaster had come their way, flooding and winds that brought so much damage. Disasters come upon us so often unexpected. And that can be hard for us. Because how do we prepare? Well, we must be willing to prepare for disasters each and every day. None of us look forward to them, though it is possible in our lives to be a bit, bit disaster-minded. It is possible for us, living comfortable lives, to look for disasters, to seek them out, to try to make our lives a little more interesting. We throw the term disaster around quite freely. We might say, oh, that vacation, that vacation was a disaster. And what we really mean is that there was some traffic along the way, and that the hotel was late in getting our room ready, and that our steak was a bit overcooked in the restaurant. The fact is, most disasters that come our way are manageable. Even terrible disasters are recoverable. We can get through them, and they do have a silver lining, these disasters do, that we can recover from, of reminding us how much we have, of reminding us how many people there are to help us, friends and strangers alike. And they also have a way of reminding us and helping us to see that though we are facing some disaster in our life, it is a recoverable one, and there are others facing far worse. In greater disasters, real disasters in their lives. Well, it depends then how you define it. And we all define disaster differently, and we can't decide to define it for ourselves, whether something is or isn't a disaster. If you want the, uh, the meaning of the word, disaster, it actually comes from astrology. 
It means against the stars. This aspirin. Against the stars, something has happened. Against fate. It wasn't supposed to happen, but here it is. Certain uh, Christian uh, theologies take this in a completely different direction. Uh, disasters are not something that go against the fates. They are something that are predestined to happen. And many, many Christians and non-Christians too believe this, that everything is determined and has been from the first moment. I like the story about the woman who strongly believed in her Christian faith in predestination. That everything that was going to happen to her, that was going to happen in this world, had already been determined way back at the beginning of creation. And there's nothing we can do to avoid these disasters that come our way. And one day, uh, she happened to trip and fall down some of her stairs. And then when she got to the bottom and hit the ground and shook her head, she said cheerfully, well, thank goodness. I got that over with. <laughs> well, whether it's against the stars or whether it is predestined, a disaster quite simply is something that changes us, that changes the circumstances of our lives. We are speaking then of those times when family, when some family event occurs, some personal event in our lives, and our life circumstances, because of this event, are completely changed. Our old patterns are gone. And new patterns must be created. Here it is one thing that can certainly be said of any disaster that comes upon us. Disasters never leave us the way they find us. After the disaster, we may be better or we may be worse. But we know that we will never, ever be quite the same again. And we do have a way of responding to disasters in different ways. One tempting way. One tempting way always to respond when something bad happens in our lives is trying to see, trying to understand who is to blame. It's a great distraction for us, being able to think, who is to blame for what we are going through right now? If we could just find that person, then, then we could uh, make sure that that person gets the guilt that they deserve. Certainly in the story of Jacob and Joseph, there was a lot of blame that could go around. Certainly uh, Reuben. Reuben was the eldest of the 12 brothers. He should have been keeping an eye on his little brother Joseph. What about Joseph himself? We know from the story that it was Joseph's arrogance that led his brothers into this desperate and criminal act. Joseph should have been a better person. Uh, he, was, he, was, he was kind of a jerk to his brothers. We could say perhaps he didn't have that coming, but certainly he uh, brought some of their animosity on himself or even Jacob himself. Jacob sent Joseph out into the fields. And what was he doing? Sending his young son out into the fields right there next to the wilderness. Yes, it was Jacob who was to blame. Well, there's nothing wrong with figuring out, trying to figure out the cause of what we are going through. That can help us as we try to grow from difficulties in life. But we have to recognize that the process of blaming ourselves for something we are going through and the process of blaming other people for what we are going through never solves the problem. <clears throat> it never helps us cope. It never helps us to change, and that's, of course, what we have to do as our environment changes, as things around us, as our challenges change, we must be willing to change as well. Perhaps it is true that with every disaster, someone is guilty. And we may feel that it is our task, our job within our family or within our close circle of friends or among our neighbors or among our co-workers to make sure that when something bad happens, blame is assigned and that that person at the very least feels guilty for what they have done. Why? Why did this happen? It can become an obsession of ours to track down the reason 
why some disaster comes. But, you know, that isn't the question that moves us forward. It's the question that does keep us looking back. The question that moves us forward is how. How are we going to cope with this change? How are we going to grow from this experience? How are we going to become, from this challenge, more the person that God has created us to be? How are we going to grow closer to God? even in the midst of disaster. Of course, that's one of the great promises of our faith, that God walks with us. God carries us through every disaster. We have such an opportunity to grow closer to Him and to grow more into the person and the people that God calls us to be. Yes, certainly it is tempting to blame it is tempting to get caught up in the why and to not remember and to think of the how, to think of the opportunity we have to grow and to change. So some people do respond to disaster by seeking someone to blame. Certainly another option, and this perhaps is even a more tempting option. Certainly for me, I feel this temptation so often when I face some challenge in life, and that is simply to give up, to quit, to not deal with it, to not face it. This is, seems to be what Jacob did. As we read his story, we've got this wonderful long story of him that, that starts with the story of him and his brother and goes throughout his long life and his 12 sons being born, his many daughters there with him, all their adventures that happened along the way. And there he is over and over again, overcoming some challenge. But then we see this is it. This moment is the one challenge he will not Overcome the one disaster he simply is unwilling to deal with. The scriptures say, again, as I read this morning, all of his sons and daughters came running to him to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted, saying, No, I will go down to my grave, mourning and grieving for my son. And we never really hear about. Jacob again, until years and years later when he finally is reunited with Joseph. His story, his adventures have come to an end because it would seem that he has given up. His grief has caught him. His grief has imprisoned him. The loss of his son it was the one disaster too many for this man. And trouble, this trouble, this disaster, left him a defeated man. You can't imprison us. Disaster can, grief can, guilt can. The brothers were imprisoned by their guilt over what they had done. Jacob was imprisoned by his grief this disaster imprisoned them, but strangely, strangely, this same disaster seemed to set Joseph free. Oh, it took a while. It didn't happen overnight. But it changed him, this adversity did. It helped him to draw closer to God. It helped him to turn away from being the arrogant young man that he was. He began to grow muscles of mind and of spirit. He began to get stronger each and every day. Down to Egypt he went as a slave. And you think, oh, things couldn't get much worse, but he worked as a slave. He started rising up within the household and then was unfairly accused and sent to prison. And even there, he began to rise. He began to crawl his way out. The scriptures uh, say that when he was down there in Egypt, uh, actually it's Psalm 105 verse 18, says that when, when Joseph went to Egypt, that is when the iron entered his soul. That 
That's when he grew. That's when he grew stronger all through this disaster. And we have to, we have to hand it to him because, my goodness, this wasn't a disaster like Jacob. Now, Jacob's disaster was terrible. It fell upon him in one moment. It came crashing down on Jacob. He had lost his son, and he ripped his clothes, and he grieved. But for Joseph, it was a slow moving disaster. It lasted for years and years as he spent time as a slave, as he spent time in prison. Slow moving disaster. That's, that's what some of us know. It isn't a sudden crashing disaster. It's a slow drip, drip, drip of disappointment. The disaster comes upon us slowly, like the dawn on a cloudy day, so that we hardly recognize that it has arrived when it has come. If Joseph had a difficult disaster to deal with, a long-running disaster. He was feeling the consequences for, of it for years, but he had an amazing strategy for dealing with it. Not looking for someone to blame, not giving up, Joseph used disaster like a ladder to climb up and to climb out. If he had to be a slave, he would be an excellent slave. He was a great slave, rising up to, uh, to lead all the other slaves in the household. And then when he was falsely accused and he was put in prison, he said he would be the best prisoner he could be. He would continue praying to God every day. He would continue trying to feel closer to God, trying to be the person that God created him to be. And the scriptures say this about him in prison. It says the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's care all of the other prisoners. And if anything was done in that prison, Joseph was the doer of it. You see, that's how Joseph dealt with disaster, with courage, that is. To be able to face up to it, to be able to recognize what you were going through and say, yes, yes, it is a disaster. It is, for me, also an opportunity. Once again, the opportunity to grow closer to God. The opportunity to become the person that God created you to be. The opportunity to let the iron enter your soul. That's how Joseph dealt with disaster. That's how he dealt with this unwelcome, unexpected crisis. He climbed through it. And he climbed out. Well, listen closely to this. It is a rare disaster that doesn't give us the opportunity to grow in some important way. And it is entirely up to us whether or not we will choose to grow or we will give up. Growing is the way that Joseph responded to his disaster. And we as Christians should respond that way as well, not by establishing blame. Never by giving up, but by rising to this challenge we have been given. And by doing all that we can do, even in the midst of disaster, To grow closer to God and to become the people that God created us to be. Let us bow in prayer. Well, loving God, we do ask that whether we are facing difficulty and disaster, or whether the bright days are bright and sunny at this moment, loving God, our prayer is the same. Guard us guide us and lead us one day at a time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.